Hello, my name is Larry Grimm. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's program, Don't Just Age, Engage. I'm your host, Larry Grimm, and today we have a very special opportunity to get to know death doulas. And the big question today is, what does a death doula do? <laughs> uh, my program, Don't Just Age, Engage, is a way of bringing resources to the uh, to our senior communities and to enable them with the information and with, uh, with help if they wish to have really extraordinary elderhoods. We, in our no Northern American culture, we're influenced highly by that here in Hawaii. We don't die well, we, 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 don't, we die pretty badly in fact. And, and, and backing up from that, I can say we don't age well, we age pretty poorly. We don't have a good sense of elderhood. I think one of the beauties of Hawaii, Hawaii is that the tradition of respect for the kupuna is high. And so we are very fortunate to have that relationship, I think, here within our island culture. Death doulas are kind of a uh, I guess uh, kind of take up from maybe from midwife and births. We, we have doulas, and as I understand it, the Greek term doula means servant, but we have midwives who take care of a birthing process. And uh, recently have come, we have had a transfer of that same practice to death and dying. My guests today are Dr. Joseph Pink, and Ms. Shelley Payette, both of whom are wonderful uh, cohorts of mine from having worked as a chaplain with Bristol Hospice here on Oahu. Joseph and Shelley, thank you so much for joining me today and joining all of our viewers <coughs> in this uh, wonderful engagement. By the way, <coughs> those of you who have questions, uh, on your email, uh, get out your email um, protocol and type in questions at Think Tech Hawaii and send your questions in and we'll be able to surface those online. There's, there's, there's your uh, indicator. So, Joseph and Shelley, what in the world does a death doula do? Shelley, you want to start with that? Sure. Well, a death doula, like, like Larry said, um, in the beginning, well, how do I easily say this? If you're used to a midwife, the midwives are there in the beginning, and a death doula, which is a death midwife, will be there towards the end of the um, person's life. Um, we will step in prior to the transitioning process into spirit. Um, there's a lot of roles that a death doula will play, um, but we are mainly there to educate and empower the family on a journey that they certainly may not have experienced quite yet. So I don't want to say too much, and just if you can pop in anything. Sorry about okay. that. All right. Well, if we think of it, there are three areas that a death doula works in. Um, prior to the transitioning of a patient, the transitioning process, and then bereavement. And so in all parts, the death doula can be involved or not. So in the beginning part, we, we can help the family um, with whatever paperwork they need to be done, with forming a memorial service, celebration of life, funeral, whatever they would like, um, whatever uh, it may be in terms of uh, religious preference, that kind of thing, music, et cetera. And we can sort of help the family prepare um, this is going over and above the bounds of what hospice is able to do with their short time with the family. Then when we have the next step is during the transition, and this is where a doula is there with the family um, when the transition is happening and we can work with the family, we can get them what they need. We can be there to help them wash the body if they like. Sometimes there's lavender um, baths, candles we can set up if they want particular music play or prayers read or chant. Um, maybe they have um, particular um, fragrances they want or flowers or how do they want the room. 
Um, we will have discussed that and we can be there for them. And then finally, we can be with the family post transition in the bereavement period um, and meet with the family and make sure they're doing okay and just hear them and be there with them as they go through the grieving process. Oh, thank you. That's a very good, quick kind of uh, quick kind of response and thumbnail response. I appreciate that. Um, that really that suggests that uh, not suggests but describes an involvement uh, with the core values that the family has, that the dying patient has, with the core concerns, maybe even a legacy in a sense that the dying person wants to leave behind. So introduce us to yourselves, please. Uh, Shelley, would you go ahead and share a little bit about who you are, what your involvements are, and maybe why in the world did you want to be a midwife to dying patients? <laughs> so I'm Shelley Payette, and I'm I'm born and raised here in Hawaii, and I've always been around that. Um, <laughs> let me let let me actually rephrase that. Um, I've been to a lot of different types of funerals since the eight, really tender age of eight. So it was never something that was uh, was never really afraid of me. And with the guidance of my mom, um, she helped me to understand the process of it. It wasn't until her passing on hospice that I realized that being at the bedside for someone um, truly is my path and what I should be doing. And that was my, my main inspiration, um, losing my mom. And then I found out about death to and I thought, you know, I felt so empowered and educated with the hospice stuff that we have um, to kind of process everything that we're going to go through. And I wanted to be that that guide for others who would welcome me at the bedside. So that's me. And um, so my, my mom, yeah, she's she's the main. Thank you, Shelly. She's inspired you. Mm -hmm. So, Joseph. Okay, so um, I have been actually volunteering for hospice. I started in 1991 volunteering, and I was passionate up then about, uh, that was sort of the end of the AIDS crisis, and I wanted to specifically work with the AIDS community for people that were dying that were alone. And so little did I know that I was doing doula work there. I was doing legacies. I was doing being at the bedside at the death. I was being there for grief, but we just didn't call it an end of life doula at that point. Um, I was an elementary teacher, finished the doctorate, went on to upstate New York to teach. Um, but all the while, I remained volunteering for hospice. And while I was at the college, I made sure that my students knew about end of life. And so my women's corral, we joined with community members and traveled around the world sing for hospices to study end of life to make sure that that word got on that end of life is okay and you need to be there for your family and others in this community and so then when i moved to hawaii um i didn't realize i would be actually working for hospice and it's been a joy and i can use all of my hats in music and education bereavement volunteers and now end of life doula and it's awesome Thank you. Thank you, both of you. I'm a, a strong fan of Alan Watts. Alan Watts wrote in the uh, 1960s, 1970s, and did a fantastic job, uh, in my opinion, of interpreting uh, Western, excuse me, Eastern Asian uh, philosophies to Western minds and doing some integrating of the two, actually. And one of the things that he said, and this was back in the 90s, um, before he died, he said, uh, we need more people who will help us have a delightful death. And I've kind of adopted that for my own praise, and I'm growing in that understanding of just what is a delightful death. And um, first thing that comes to my mind about this is that our culture has a particular teaching about death and dying. What have you found is the cultural attitude towards aging, death, and dying? 
it, it's really difficult to answer that question. Because um, um, I guess the way I was brought up, I was brought up to talk about things, to talk about end of life. Um, but I do have friends and that their family were just afraid. It, it was just something that they don't want to talk about. They don't want to bring it to the dinner table. Um, so, and it, the, the, the wonderful thing about Hawaii is there's so many different cultures. So, and the generations also. So the older generations, there's certain cultures. It's taboo to talk about end of life. It's taboo to talk about anything like that. It's, it's just not something that was, um, it's something that that, gen that generation was raised with. Um, I guess maybe I'm a later generation and maybe that was okay. So yeah, I can't really say too much. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joseph? You know, we see this when um, volunteers come to us through training and we try to get to the bottom, you know, what is your experience with death? What do you, what do you think about death? And we have the gamut from, I don't want any part of this, to I embrace it. It's a, it's a part of life. This is what we need to go through. Let me be there. Um, I love that term, delightful death. Because really, what does that mean? Peace. Hey, peace and honoring the loved one and honoring the family and their traditions. And with that peace, knowing that things are sort of in the work, you can have a delightful death, um, a peace-filled death with those helping you in that journey. Uh, describe for us one of your experiences so far. Would you, either of you or both of you, <clears throat> as doulas? As, I'll let Joseph go first because he has <laughs> a really nice story on where his legacy works. Yeah, I just completed um, a, a video legacy project on a, a gentleman here, Stanley Kao, who was in Pearl Harbor and Korea. And he, he is a member of St. Peter's, and I was able to meet with him since, I don't know, last October, I think we started this journey, and off and on, and, and videoing his stories, and hearing his stories. And on one of the last visits, he got enough energy, and, and he was a really accomplished chemist. And he's, he used to, as he said, I'd go to the homes for the old folks and play for them. He was 96 at that time. So as he played, I was recording, and I was able to thread his music throughout the video. But he got his stories out. He was able to leave his legacies, the stories of Pearl Harbor, the stories of Korea, the stories of the hardships that he went through. And there's so much more that's not on that half hour video, but he just transitioned last week. And I know, I, I'm sure that his peace in transitioning was that fact that his family would be able to remember him through pictures, his spoken word through the, the video. It was a beautiful thing. And I know his son had sent me a video of him thanking me just before his transition. It was a beautiful thing to do. So you really are very much uh, ready to do whatever, whatever might be appropriate for each, each, each family, each person? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Shelley, and your, your experience have you had? I know so you both I, are really new in this. So my experience um, I, I've had with three or four different types of patients. And um, one being pretty difficult, I wanna share this one because um, when I was talking earlier about the different generations and the culture, um, this particular one, the parents were very traditional. They came from China and their daughter is more Western, Westernized. So she, her thought process on the dying process is so there was a lot of flashing. So being there as a neutral ground for them, I found very rewarding um, so that everybody can hear things, um, you know, meaning they can talk about everything on the table and talk about their worries, what's going to happen, and then lay it out as a map to say, okay, so this is what's going to happen. Um, this, this patient actually became a patient of later when the, the husband realized that she actually needed more help. His wife needed more help. 
Um, so in that difficult case, um, it was it was really um, it was really touching to see how the family could go together towards the end, because there was a lot of fighting in between. But towards the end, um, when the when the mom did transition, um, she was able to um, share her love and her her, her gratitude for the amount of care and love that they put in towards her in the future. So that that was one that I think will always stick with me. The other the other patients, um, you know, they're fun. I have this one guy, um, one patient. He he's a big Elvis fan. It was just so much fun to be around. Mm-hmm. But that's always really rewarding. So <laughs> really cute. So but yeah, that one is um, the most difficult patients. Um, I find I learned so much more. From the, yeah. Good, thank mm-hmm. you. What's the optimal situation to develop a good relationship and outcome of your doula work? What's the optimal? Um, do you want people to sign up for, you know, when they enter into hospice care? Do you want them to, uh, I mean, obviously you can't have doula just last minute response. Um, what what would be an optimal optimal description? Excuse me, a description of an optimal process for you as a doula to engage patient and family. Um, hmm. I think really anywhere along the line is good to engage a doula, um, knowing that end of life doulas really are outside of the hospice realm. Um, There are some things that we can do as hospice workers, such as like 11th hour volunteers that that sit with patients around the clock until so they don't have to die alone. But then there are other things that, well, mainly we don't have enough time in our our hourage that we have from Bristol. And so we do some of our doula work outside and with patients outside of those on service. But any time that a family wants doula work, is it's appropriate because the families have to come to that decision. And it's just a matter of doulas listening and being there and then gentle guiding. It's not coming in and taking over, um, but it's sort of that slow, relaxed, let's help, let me help you kind of a thing. So anywhere along the stage is great to call in a doula. May I tell you my experience of a doula? Please. My experience of, I've only had one experience as a hospice chaplain with Bristol Hospice. And one of our patients um, determined that she was going to take advantage of them, of the Our Care, Our Choice, Our Choice, Our Care Act, and uh, determined when, and that she was going to, uh, seek physician assistance to her dying. And, um, and so she did work with a doula in preparing for that, for that event. Um, and uh, the doula <clears throat> had kind of an organizational, I would, I would call it an order of service, <laughs> kind of had an organ, organizational uh, layout of what would come when. Uh, in accordance with what the patient had said was her preferences. And she had um, friends gathered. They they were having some food together. Um, we were, they were chatting around her, her bedside, laughing and, and uh, crying and enjoying her. Um, <clears throat> at one point, um, they asked me to, the doula asked me to read a, a poem that she had requested that I read. And I did. There was a, another friend who did a, a, an appropriate hula dance at bedside with when some music came on. Um, then, um, then the then the doula poured out glasses of champagne for everybody, <laughs> and we and we went into the bedroom with uh, with the beloved patient and toasted her, and. Uh, really said, had some goodbyes. Then the doula uh, was overseeing, sort of an overseer of all the, all the movement of 
of the people and the and the uh, particular desires that she had expressed. Um, medications were prepared and brought in for her, and uh, and she then she partook of the medication. And and then I uh, I dismissed myself, but I suspect the doula was also present for the removal of the body, and uh, and for the and for saying goodbye to the guests. So um, I I saw the doula. Does that make sense? Was that kind of a common general Absolutely. orientation? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, in a state in a state like this where you have patients who have opted for a more determin- um, determinable di- time and date, <laughs> uh, then you can have a kind of ritualizing of the passing or ritualizing of the dying so that everybody can really benefit beautifully from that wonderful experience. Um, so, 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 how are you making sure people know that you are doing this, that, that that's available? So, right now, it's a matter of getting the word out. So, I started the um, the healing music, healing tears, um, on my Facebook and Instagram. And for healing music, healing tears, it's actually going to be a course that I'm setting up for the bereaved to, to learn how to use music to help them grieve. And throughout those things, I will be continuing to put more stuff, more information about doula work, what we do, what is possible. Um, but it's a matter of just talking right now and, and getting the word out. Shelly, you have any other ideas on that? Actually, it's the same thing you just said. It's oh, Right now, it is part of because for that difficult patient, that was a referral, personal referral. And um, just like Joseph, I, I think for years it's from the church, so that's word of mouth as well. So right now that's what it is, but I have a feeling that it's definitely going to grow. <laughs> good. So. good. Good. Well, that's good news because as a chaplain, I'm sure you have have wonderful um, off, gifts to offer. Um, if a chaplain is involved, what is the difference, do you think, between the work of the doula and the work of the chaplain? I have a little bit of investment in this, having been a chaplain and being a chaplain. Uh, how would you um, coordinate with a chaplain at bedside? Well, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for doulas to work hand in hand with chaplains and those of faith um, traditions, um, and well, they should. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn about each other, to learn about the family's customs, their cultures, what they would like from both ends. Um, and I would, I would definitely look forward to doing that. I'm wondering about uh, family resistance to death. Uh, families who um, don't feel as though uh, talking about death, uh, encouraging death, or talking about death actually brings death on faster. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever encountered this or thought about this, and how would you approach this with someone? Right, especially my my days of just strictly volunteering, you know, you You've got to start with simple conversations in in an area that is suitable for all. That's not going to bring any kind of emotion on with it. And that's all you can do. You start with the simple and you go from there. Because there is there, there is definitely going to be resistance to talking about that. Who wants to, right? It, it's the family and chaos losing somebody they love. But again, for that delightful death, that simple conversation can bring much peace later on. Shelly, do you have anything to, to add, add to, to that? Me? Actually, honestly, no, because um, yes, it is a simple conversation to start. 
because you want to understand where they are in that journey too. You don't want to just jump on it. <laughs> then you, the resistance will become a lot greater. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We have about a few minutes left, and I want to well, thank you again, both of you, for for sharing your story and letting us to, to see a, a real doula in life and, <laughs> and to understand better what, what, what a death doula does. What, what final things would you like to say? And please be uh, shameless in your self-promotion. What was the final things that you would like to, to leave with our viewers, the final comments? Well, for me, the bottom line is love. And all of this transfers to love, love of family, love of your life, love of what you want your legacy to be. And so, yes, we, we would love working with you, definitely. But the important thing is that you have peace and things are prepared and things can go the way that you want them because of this love you have for your family and the family has for you. Shelly? Yeah. Love and acceptance. That's what's going to bring the peace on and just being open to us. Um, we're always happy to sit with anyone and to even just provide education. And if it goes further than that, then that's awesome. Thank you. How, thank you. And finally, how might we contact you? So easiest way is to get a hold of Bristol Hospice and there, um, but definitely an email and um, phone number and our, our my website, josephepping.com, and that can give you all the information as well to get a hold of both of us. josephepping.com. Yep. That's E E P I N N. Two P's. Okay. E P P I N K. Oh, E P P I N K. That's it. josephepping.com. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you both so very much. Thank you. And uh, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you, viewers, for joining with us today and exploring some of the most important um, concerns around aging and death and dying that we can raise. If this is something of a personal show. It's not issue oriented, but it's more oriented towards experience of aging. And aging can be a dilemma. It can be a traumatic experience. We can find ourselves isolated and marginalized as we age by family, by friends, by culture. And that's no way to, to age. That's a bad way to age. That's not a healthy way to age. So um, I want to invite you also to check out my website, personalcoachingforlifeandfaith.com. And also to come back in two weeks. Let me present to you something new in two weeks on aging so that we don't just age, but engage. And go to the um, Think Tech Hawaii website too and make a donation. You can donate a little bit. No, 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 don't donate a lot and, and enable this wonderful experience to continue to grow and bloom and blossom in, in Hawaii. Thank you so very much. Aloha.